That's the theme from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight, a program of mystery with Vincent Price as your host. Here's a preview. If I wanted to be free, I could divorce Marjorie. And why haven't you? Well, that's just it. Maybe I don't want to. In any case, if I haven't tried even that, why would I jump to murder? Human behavior is a mysterious thing. The Sears Radio Theater will begin after this message from your local station. This is Vincent Price. The Gilded Age. America in the decades following the Civil War. Mark Twain satirized it. Edith Wharton chronicled it. It was a time of rapidly expanding fortunes of overnight wealth. The captains of industry and the robber barons ruled the land. But it was one thing to make money and quite another matter to know how to behave once you had it. Social arbiters like Ward McAllister and Mrs. Astor came forth to set down the rules of proper etiquette for everything from table manners to hospital visits. The year is 1890. The place, the fashionable New York townhouse of Sampson and Marjorie Cuthbert. Samson is a diamond in the rough, a westerner more at home in the mining camps of Nevada, where he made his fortune, than in the parlors of the East. He had come East many years ago with the simple intention of parlaying his considerable fortune into an even greater sum on the stock exchange, and then returning to his beloved mountains. But as fate would have it, he met and married an attractive and prominent socialite, Marjorie Pierce Chatley. It did not take them long to discover that they had less in common than they thought. Marjorie's obsessive devotion to the social graces and her relentless efforts to civilize Samson began to grate on him. And their marriage soon became an armed truce. And that's only the beginning of our story. Sears Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis' production of The Sears Radio Theater. Our story, The Perfect Hostess, by Percy Granger. Our stars, Marvin Miller, Virginia Gregg, and Lynn Berman. The Sears Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops for value. As our story opens, Marjorie Cuthbert is in the grand dining room of her stately Fifth Avenue mansion with her butler, William. They are making a final check of the preparations for a formal dinner party to be held that evening. William, the centerpiece looks one or two inches off. Did the servants measure it correctly? I'll have them make sure, madam. The wine has been decanted. At ten o'clock this morning, just as you ordered. You have the seating arrangement. It's been placed in the foyer for the guests to see as they arrive. Good. And how are things in the kitchen? Oh, Mrs. Tunnels tells me the rack of lamb has just gone into the oven. Oh, I'm so anxious that everything go just right. The new consul general from Great Britain is the guest of honor. Oh, I'm sure he will be most impressed, ma'am. It is more important that he feel at home. Of course. And now I must get ready. Oh, uh, where is Mr. Cuthbert? Oh, I believe he's in the library, ma'am. Well, he really must see this table. It's my masterpiece. Samson, are you busy? No. Uh, uh, oh. Uh, I was taking a snooze. Oh, good. I didn't interrupt anything then. Come with me. What for? I have something to show you. What? You'll see. I think even you will have to admit I've quite outdone myself this time. Uh, uh, I was having a dandy dream about the West. I was on a train going through the Rockies and... Then the boys met me at the station and drove me out to the mine. Well, you'll be on the train first thing in the morning for your annual trip there. suppose you're looking forward to that, as always. I am. The air in this city is positively unhealthy. Rarefied, dear. Rarefied. 
I'll get you to appreciate it yet. If my cronies could see me in this smoking jacket, they'd laugh their heads off. Close your eyes. Now, open. Well, what do you think? Of what? The dining room table. Set for dinner, so. Is that all you have to say? What do you expect me to say? Look at this forest of glasses. How's a man supposed to know which one to use? This is for red wine. This for white. This for sherry. This for champagne. And this for water. Honestly, Samson, sometimes I think you deliberately play ignorant just to aggravate me. Three forks apiece when one could do just as nicely. Fish. Meat. And salad. Do you realize that your uncouth attitude is the talk of the town? Do you think I enjoy being snickered at by a lot of ninnies who've nothing better to do than memorize forks? Oh, Samson, you still have the soul of a roughneck. Uh, high society is no place for a man. Can I go now? Yes, it's time to change for dinner. You do remember that it's formal, don't you? That means evening dress. Now, I have to pack tonight. My train leaves at the crack of dawn. Have your valet pack for you. I can pack for myself. I don't even know why we have that fellow on the staff. Every gentleman has a valet. I'm not a gentleman. I'm a minor. Yes, and it certainly shows. The British Consul General is coming this evening, and I hope you can refrain from using vulgar expressions like snooze and cronies and... Crack of dawn. <clears throat> oh, William. Hey, excuse me, madam. There's a gentleman here to see Mr. Cuthbert. Who is he? He gives his name as Mr. Jonas Lamar. Did he have a card? Oh, bother the card. What's his business? He says it's personal, sir. Well, show him into the library. Mr. Cuthbert? Yes, who are you? My name is Jonas Lamar. Yes? What's your business? Uh, perhaps I've caught you at a bad time. No, no. And in fact, to be honest with you, I'm in your debt. Your arrival rescued me from a rather tiresome situation. Indeed. Uh, my wife is giving one of her infernal dinner parties tonight, and she was dragging me around the dining room to ooh and ah over her handiwork. But forgive me, I, I don't need to bother you with my domestic situation. On the contrary, your domestic situation is of great interest to me. Oh? In fact, it bears directly on the purpose of my visit. I've been recommended to you by, uh, shall we say, mutual friends. Oh, yeah? Who's that? It would not be politic for me to mention names. Suffice to say, they are known to you in the social circles in which you move. Just what is the purpose of your visit, Mr. Lamar? That, sir, I shall get to in a moment. But be sure of this. Your life will be a happier one as a result of my visit. Samson Cuthbert, a man trapped by his own wealth, straight-jacketed in an elegant society whose code of manners he can never hope to tolerate, longing for the rough-and-tumble freedom of his native mountains far to the west. Come, sir, you play games with me. Not at all. What friends of mine sent you here? I'm not at liberty to say. Well, it's not my habit to prejudge a man's intentions, Mr. Lamar, but it sounds to me like you're preparing to deal from a cold deck. I am a businessman, much like yourself, and I've come to you with a proposition. Well, if it's not honest, you're wasting your time, and I'll personally turn you out. If it is, I'll offer you a drink. I'll let you be the judge. Tell me, you are not originally from the East, are you? I'm a native of California. My father went west in the gold rush days. He lost his stake the day I was born, and when I was older, I vowed to succeed where he failed. And succeed you did. Your silver mines are the most productive in the west. Uh, I worked alongside my men. I thoroughly enjoyed my life till I made the mistake of coming east. You are unhappy here. That's no secret. Why don't you move back west? 
Well, there are ties that hold a body down, Mr. Lamar. So true. A wife abhors the West. To her, civilization stops at the Hudson River. So here you are, trapped by circumstance. Your point? If your wife were, uh, forgive me, no longer around, you could return to the West. I could and would do so instantly, but such isn't the case. My wife is... What are you suggesting? What are you thinking? <laughs> How dare you? Me? The thought was yours. At your suggestion? Murder, sir. Is that what you sell? You're a hired gun? Uh, that's a Western phrase. We don't use such terms here. Mr. Lamar. My clientele are from the very highest level of society. People of position, people of affairs, lawyers, bankers, businessmen, and ladies, too. The sort of people, in short, whom your wife delights in having to dinner. I don't believe it. Oh, there's a great deal that goes on behind the facade, Mr. Cuthbert. A businessman wants a rival or a partner disposed of. A jilted heiress, her former lover. A jealous mistress, the meddlesome wife. Which brings us back to your proposition. For a fee to be agreed upon, I will make you a free man again. And I will do it in such a way that no blame can possibly fall on you. Nor will any suspicion be raised that murder was the cause of Mrs. Cuthbert's untimely passing. Mr. Lamar, if I never resorted to murder in the Nevada mining camps where violence is a way of life, what makes you think I can't handle my domestic affairs short of such a thing now? Domestic situations are the most conducive to murder. Well, if I wanted to be free, I could divorce Marjorie. And why haven't you? Well, that's just it. Maybe I don't want to. In any case, if I haven't tried even that, why would I jump to murder? Human behavior is a mysterious thing. We often balk at the obvious solution, yet leap to embrace the extreme. Well, how, how would you propose to do what you say you can do in such a way that I'd not be held to blame? You leave tomorrow morning for the West, do you not? How do you know that? I have not timed my visit arbitrarily, Mr. Cuthbert. Well, yes, I leave on the 8 o'clock train to Chicago. It's the first leg of my yearly trip out to inspect my properties. I'm generally gone for a month. But perhaps this year, not for so long, eh? When you've received the telegram in Chicago saying your wife has died suddenly of apoplexy, you would return at once to New York, wouldn't you? To see to the funeral arrangements and to close down this house for good, hmm? Uh. As much as my wife and I are estranged, it never for one moment crossed my mind a murderer. Perhaps you would like some time to think it over. Uh, perhaps I could return after your dinner party this evening for your decision. You're damn sure of yourself. How do you know I won't have the police here waiting for you? You will do as you wish, of course. And now, with your permission, I will see myself out. Who's that? Samson. What the devil do you mean barging in here like this? I'm sorry, but something awful has happened. I'm in terrible trouble. Trouble? What do you mean? One of our guests for this evening has just sent his servant round with a note saying he has to beg off. Oh, is that all? But that leaves us with an uneven number for dinner. We can't do that. It just isn't done in formal entertaining. I personally can't see what possible difference it makes. It would never occur to my husband to introduce us, sir. But I'm Marjorie Cuthbert, the beauty of this beast. I'm Jonas Lamar. Very pleased, indeed, to make your acquaintance. Oh, well, you are gallant. Are you a business associate of Samson? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. you don't know him. He's, he's from out west. He's a banker in Carson City. He handles my finances. And is this your first visit to New York? No, I have been here before. Excuse us, Marjorie. I was just taking Mr. Lamar to the door. <gasps> Mr. Lamar, are you free this evening? I, I believe I have an appointment, but that is not until much later. Would you... Would you do me the favor 
and the honor of joining us for dinner. No. I'd be delighted. Oh, then we should be even again. Oh, Marjorie, he can't come here. Why, why ever not? Oh, I see. Well, the dinner is formal. That is no problem. I have the requisite clothes. Oh, then you can return and join us around 7.30. It will give me the greatest of pleasure. Uh, look here. Isn't this marvelous? Your presence, Mr. Lamar, will make Samson very happy. It is said that the rules of etiquette exist to reduce our anxiety in social situations. But in Samson Cuthbert's case, they have only served to aggravate him to the point where he may be prepared to countenance murder. His victim, meanwhile, is beset with concerns of her own. As she nervously watches the arrival of her distinguished guests, she chats with Dr. Woolsey, a longtime friend of the family. Well, Marjorie... Congratulations on assembling such an august cast for your dinner party to honor the British Consul General. Oh, if only Mrs. Astor herself could have attended. How much longer till dinner is announced? I'm famished. We're still missing one guest. A last-minute substitution. Oh, there he is now. Mr. Jonas Fitzpatrick Excuse Lamar. me, doctor. I must go say hello. Marjorie, wait. Uh, who is that man? A business associate of Samson. It's from out west. Oh, really? Why? He looks familiar. I believe I've seen him before. Well, he did say this was not his first visit to New York. Come on, I'll introduce you. No, no, no. Now, something the matter. Well, I'd like to try to remember where we might have met. I half suspect the circumstances were less than savory. Doctor, what a thing to say. Your husband's latched onto him quickly enough. Seems to be trying to draw him away from the rest of the guests. A guest is under his host's protection for as long as he is in his house. And that includes protection from insinuations by other guests. Now, if you'll excuse me. Of course. I wish you hadn't accepted my wife's invitation, Lamar. You put me in a damned uncomfortable situation. But why? You've done nothing to be afraid of. Unless, of course, this means you've been considering my proposal. I don't like this. It's, it's, it's not right. Well, I am thoroughly enjoying myself. I can never resist the temptation to meet socially the people I have worked for in private. You know some of these people? Oh, yes. Then your coming here was downright foolish. Oh, believe me, Mr. Cuthbert. I'm as safe as if I were on a desert island. Dr. Woolsey keeps looking over here. I think he's talking to Marjorie about you. What if he recognizes you? His face is not instantly familiar to me, but if he does know me, there can only be one explanation. You aren't seriously suggesting he's had dealings with you, are you? He's a harmless old society quack. He's been Marjorie's family doctor for years. In any case, there's no cause for alarm. Only the guilty will know me. And the guilty are notorious for their discretion. Oh, great Scott, Marjorie's coming this way. Samson, oh, good evening, Mr. Mm. Lamar. So good of you to come. You're most kind to have me. Samson, there is to be no talking shop this evening. Oh, we, we weren't talking business. Well, you're monopolizing your guest, and that's bad form. You know, Mr. Lamar, I can't tell you what an unexpected pleasure it is to have met you. Indeed. Oh, yes, I assumed all of my husband's friends from the West to be diamonds in the rough like him. But you seem positively at home here. And so I am, Mrs. Cuthbert, very much at home. Well, I wish you would give Samson lessons in deportment. He's as stiff as his shirt front. Why can't you for once resist a temptation to humiliate me in public? And now, dear, you must permit me to steal your friend from you and circulate him. No, no, you, you mustn't do that. Oh, but of course I must. Come, Mr. Lamar. I want to introduce you to your dinner partner. Uh, Samson. Uh, what? Oh. Oh, Doctor, you startled me. I'm sorry. Uh, how are you this evening? Well, there's nothing wrong. Oh, I should hope not. The gentleman Marjorie just led off. Uh, uh, Mr. Lamar? I barely know the man. Oh? Well, Marjorie gave me to understand that he was an associate of yours from out west. Oh, uh, well, yes. He, 
He's a banker from Carson City. He's financed a venture or two for me, but that was some time ago. You know, I have a curious feeling that I've seen him somewhere before. Oh? Yes. And unless I'm very much mistaken, a number of your other guests have, too. His, his arrival seemed to cause a bit of stir. Mark, I can't believe that you'd have met him, Doctor. Well, perhaps not. But still... Ah, I... here's William now to announce dinner. Oh, good. That's what I've been waiting for. I... I suppose I had your friend confused with someone else. Uh, let's find our dinner partners and go in, shall we? <laughs> I think I've ever spent a longer evening. Yet we weathered it without incident. That must give you a certain confidence. Relief, that's what I feel, Omar. The other guests are gone, your wife's retired, and here we are, just the two of us alone in your library. Yes, it's over, thank God. Over? I doubt it. What do you mean? Else why did you ask me to stay as the rest were leaving? Well, you wanted an answer. Yes. I mean, well, I was curious, I'll admit that. I, I am curious as to how you operate. I, I wanted to ask you some more questions. I think the time for asking questions is past, Mr. Cuthbert. Are you going to offer me that drink now? What? You said if my business was dishonest, you'd throw me out. But if it appealed to you, you'd offer me a drink, remember? Cognac. Splendid. Thank you. Now to arrange the details. You leave New York at 8 o'clock and arrive in Chicago at noon the following day. And the next leg of your journey takes you... To Salt Lake City. Well, we can't let you get that far. Too much traveling. How long is your layover in Chicago? Until the following morning. Precise time? The train leaves for Salt Lake at 9 o'clock a.m. Excellent. And what hotel will you be staying at in Chicago? The Chinook Arms. You may expect a telegram to reach you there before you depart for your train. Well, what will the telegram say? That your wife has died of apoplexy. In fact, she will have been suffocated. By you? By me. And how do you propose... If you will give me a key to the back entrance to your house and tell me where some jewelry is hidden, it needn't be valuable. I don't make my living by robbery. But you want to make that appear to be the motive, huh? You're beginning to think with your blood. Well, here's a key to the side entrance. Marjorie keeps a few knickknacks in the drawer by her bed. Good. And that brings us to the matter of my fee. Twenty-five thousand dollars. Twenty-five? I charge what the freight will bear, as you businessmen are fond of saying. Very well. But I assume you'll want payment in cash. And I haven't that kind of money in the house. Pay me the entire sum afterwards when you are closing out your affairs. You trust me? We're both gentlemen. Well, shall we have a final drink to seal the bargain? No. Just leave. Good morning, sir. May I help you? Mr. Cuthbert, room 212. Yeah. I'm supposed to catch the 905 to Salt Lake City. Oh, you, you want to check out then? You have your key? I uh, hope you're in charge of a brief visit with us. Have a good trip. I uh, was expecting a message. I, well, I, I mean, I wasn't, but is there anything? Well, let me see now. Room 212. No, nothing in your box. Are you sure? Well, you can see for yourself. It's empty. But I was... Uh... It's important you see. Oh, I'm sorry. You better go or you'll miss your train. If anything arrives, we'll forward to you in Salt Lake. There's got to be a telegram. Oh, 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 just a minute. These just come in. I haven't had time to slot them yet. Oh, yeah, here we are. Uh, Samson Cuthbert. Uh, I'm terribly sorry, so I'm glad you insisted. Yes, we regret to inform you that your wife... The exact cause of death is not yet known. Oh, I am sorry, Mr. Cuthbert. This is it. 
Are you, are you all right? When's the next train back to New York? Oh, oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. We got the schedule right here, sir. Uh, let, let me see. Now, let's see. Here we go. New York, New York. New York. What's today? Friday? Yeah, is it a holiday? No, there's no holiday. There we are. You got a train leaving in, in 22 minutes. Thanks. Yeah, my, my sympathies, sir. Of course, a loss is easier to bear when it's anticipated. Who said I anticipated it? Well, you said you were expecting a telegram. I said no such thing. If it hadn't been for your incompetence. Listen, this is the last time the Chinook Arms gets my business, young man, and you can tell that to your manager. Yes? Oh, Mr. Cuthbert. Hello, William. We expected you'd be in Salt Lake City about it. I came back as soon as I heard. Heard, sir? As soon as I got the telegram. Telegram. Yes, about Mrs. Cuthbert. Yeah. Well, is she? Well, she's in the morning room, sir, answering the day's mail. She'll be very surprised to see you. Vincent Price again, and here's the concluding act of The Perfect Hostess. Marjorie? Wait, now, wait. Wait just a minute. Something's wrong, that's for sure. Samson, what are you doing home? Uh, uh, you're, you're all right. Nothing's gone wrong, has it? I don't understand. Well, I... sit down. You're as pale as if you'd seen a ghost. Would you like some water? I'll ring for William. No, 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 no. What's happened? Why are you bad? Well, I, I, I just decided not to go. But why not? You always look forward so much to your annual escape. I know, but I, I changed my mind, that's all. Oh, my dear, that's sweet. Oh. What? I just remembered I've invited some people for dinner tonight. I'll have to tell William to set an extra place. Well, I'm not hungry. <laughs> but, my dear, it's only 11 o'clock in the morning. Oh, yes, of course. Uh... I'm sure by dinner time you will have worked up a splendid appetite. <sighs> Samson, I'm very glad you decided not to go. Why? Oh, it's silly. But I'm glad you're back. Oh, just one thing. You won't mind being 13th at the table, will you? Thirteen. I've invited eleven people, twelve counting myself. You'll be unlucky thirteen. I thought you couldn't have an uneven number. That's for formal dinners only, but it is a breach of etiquette to have thirteen people any time. Then you think considerations like that are silly, don't you? And you certainly aren't superstitious. Why is she being so cheerful? How much does she know what happened? Here we are, sir. I've laid out your clothes for dinner. Huh? Oh, thanks, William. Would you like me to assist you, sir? Uh, w William, how were things in my absence? You were only gone four days, sir. But did anything happen? Oh, yeah. What? Well, now, Mrs. Cuthberg had friends to tea yesterday. The Trilliams and their daughter, Ariel, just graduated from Vancouver. Yes, 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 but... Uh, Colleges for women, sir. What will they think of me? There was nothing went amiss. Not at all. Mrs. Cuthbert runs out very ably in your absence, sir. You, could, you can be very proud of her. Who's that? Well, I'll see, sir. William, I would like to speak to my husband. Mrs. Cuthbert, sir. Uh, let her come in. I'd like to speak to him alone. Of course, ma'am. Here it comes. Now the axe is going to fall. She can't keep this facade up forever. Samson, I... I don't know where to begin. Don't look guilty. They'll have no proof. Only the key I gave Lamar, and I can say that was stolen. I want to apologize. After you left four days ago, I... When I began to think about our marriage... What? It's not worked out the way we intended it to, has it? When I first met you, I was so swept off my feet. And you thought I was so demure. And I jumped you and you jumped me. And now we live as if... It's just not right, Samson. Not right? Two people who are properly married shouldn't have to escape from one another the way you feel you have to escape from me each year when you go out west. 
And I know it's because I haven't made the effort to be the kind of wife I should be for the man I chose to marry. What are you talking about? And then, when you showed up so unexpectedly this morning and said you'd changed your mind about going, I can't tell you how wonderful that made me feel. Were you thinking the same thing, too? That something was dreadfully wrong between us? Marjorie, I can't stand this anymore. What happened? That's what I'm telling you. I came to a realization. I see now. I've been trying to change you, and that's wrong. I should be happy and proud of the man I fell in love with. It was because you were unlike any man I'd ever met, so vigorous and untamed, that I fell in love with you. Are you making fun of me? No. Oh, no. That's... That's just where I've been so wrong. She's trying to trap me. You got angry with me, which you had every right to do. This sham, this pretended innocence, how much longer is she going to keep this up? Anyway, I just wanted to say that I'm prepared to try to change and patch things up between us. She's laying it on with a trowel. I can't put up with much more of this. And the decision I came to is, well, if you really want to move to the West, if that's where you need to be, then I'm willing to share that life with you. What? I'm willing to move. Out west? Yes. What's going on? What? What are you trying to prove? What are you trying to get me to say? What do you mean? The telegram. Confront her with the telegram. That'll crack through this maddening politeness. What's that? You know damn well what it is, so quit playing games with me. Let's just lay all our cards out on the table. We regret to inform you. Dead? Me? Is this why you came home? Because you thought I was dead. She won't drop the pretense. Is that her plan? To keep up this maddening gaiety forever? To hold my attempt to kill her over my head for the rest of my life? Then I'll resolve it with this poker. Samson! You're dead! You're dead! Marjorie. Marjorie. I wouldn't have done that if... you made me do that. I'm sorry I had to do that. I need something to steady my nerves. Why am I hanging around here? I, I gotta get away before those dinner guests arrive. Dr. Woolsey, sir. What? What's he doing here? Why, he was invited for dinner, sir. Oh, well, send him in. Dr. Woolsey. Forgive my coming early, Sampson, but I wanted to speak with you. Is Mrs. Cuthbert down yet? Uh, no, no. Uh, in, in fact, she isn't feeling well. She she won't be joining us for dinner, I don't think. Oh, well, perhaps I should go up and have a look at her. No, no, no. She's resting quite peacefully just now. She's asleep. It's, it's nothing. It must be more than that to keep her from living up to her reputation as the perfect hostess, Sampson. Still, uh, if she doesn't want to be disturbed, I'll respect her wishes. Anyway, it's really you I want to talk to. Me? I want a word with you in private. Well, of course, if... Uh... I don't suppose Marjorie told you what happened while you were gone. Did something happen? A man was apprehended here in your house. A man? Really? He's in jail at this very moment. Oh, I, I can't imagine why Marjorie didn't say anything. I can. She didn't want to cause you concern. What what's, what was this man doing? The motive seems to have been robbery. At least that's the official charge against him. How was he apprehended? He somehow gained access to Marjorie's bedroom. Normally she would have been asleep, but that evening she was still awake. She heard him and sounded the alarm. The man tried to flee, but he was apprehended. Well, thank goodness for that, huh? The reason she wasn't asleep, Samson, was because she was thinking about you... She told me she has come to a decision about your marriage. Yes, uh, we had a long talk about it uh, just a few minutes ago. That's good. I hope for her sake you came to some happy understanding. Why do you say for her sake? 
I suspect Mr. Lamar's motive may have been something quite different than robbery. Lamar? He was the man. But of course you knew that. What do you mean? He was here to murder Marjorie. That's crazy. Is it? When I first saw him here five nights ago, I was sure I'd seen him before. And then the day following his arrest, I remembered where. Your friend is in a very curious profession, Sampson. You couldn't know that unless... Unless... Unless you had dealings with him yourself. Oh, no, no, no. You're quite wrong. I was conducting a coroner's inquest a number of years ago into the death of the De Palfrey girl who died in that mysterious boating accident. Your Mr. Lamar was one of the witnesses. He'd been a crew member on the boat. That's preposterous. It, it can't be the same man. Mr. Lamar is a banker. For... I checked with your bank in Carson City, Sampson. They have no Jonas Lamar working for them. Well, what of it? I was the one who sent you the telegram in Chicago. You? Yes. That wasn't a very amusing joke, Doctor. Joke, Samson, or part of a preconceived plan? Did you tell Marjorie any of this? No. And I doubt the thought of foul play ever crossed her mind. She's too good a person to ever harbor such suspicions, especially about her own husband. Who else knows about it? No one. What are you going to do? Under the circumstances, nothing. Nothing? I pride myself on being a reasonably good judge of character. And my guess is you've learned your lesson. Marjorie told me about the decision she reached to move out west with you. I honestly think she wants the two of you to make a fresh start. And I trust that will resolve the strain between you. Therefore, I'm prepared to forget the whole matter and... Wish you the best of luck. So, the other guests are beginning to arrive. Oh, good. As usual, I'm famished. Woolsey suspects the truth, but he has no proof that would hold up in court. And he knows that Marjorie is willing to leave New York. So if I contrive to make it appear that both of us leave first thing tomorrow, he need never know. Nobody need ever know. Mr. Cuthbert? Uh, uh, Mr. Cuthbert, I am only saying what a lucky man I think you are. And Mrs. Astor and my wife and I have known Marjorie since she was a little girl. She was always the liveliest person in our little group. I'm so sorry she's not feeling well and can't join us this evening. Oh, but of course I'm here. You think a perfect hostess would be absent from her own party? Marjorie! What? I had a bit of a sore throat, but I'm quite all right now. Marjorie, are you really all right? Of course, I realize my tardiness makes me 13th at table. But that's a small enough risk to take to be with my friends and my husband. Was the consomme brunoise to everyone's satisfaction? M -m Marjorie, does this mean you, you forgive me for what I've done? Uh, uh, what do you mean, uh, Mr. Cuthbert? What? Uh, Dr. Woolsey, uh... Who is he talking to? Marjorie. I, I'm, I'm talking to Marjorie. Oh, uh, I think I know what's happened. You, sir, call the police at once. The police? Uh, but uh, where are you going? Upstairs. But I'm afraid it's too late. Theater has been brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company, where our policy is satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Sears, where America shops for value. The Perfect Hostess was written by Percy Granger, produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Marvin Miller, Virginia Gregg, and Len Berman. Featured in the cast were Hans Conried and Howard Culver. The music for Sears Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. This is Art Gilmore speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Sears Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI.